And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amber Mace, and I'm the Deputy Director of the California Council on Science and Technology. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of who we are and what we do, and then I'm going to turn it over to Susan Hubbard to lead the panel for us. So thanks for joining this conversation, and we, we do want this to be a conversation, so it's nice to have this kind of intimate setting for it. And the California Council on Science and Technology is a nonprofit. It's nonpartisan, and we were created at the request of the legislature 30 years ago to serve as an independent source of science and advice to state decision makers. So we were created to be at the service of decision makers, and we do that by tapping into an incredible network of resources, knowledge, and expertise through our universities and our national laboratories. And we have some of those uh, experts with us today, as well as some of our state expert partners and nonprofit partners. Uh, so today, uh, we are going to have what is our fourth expert briefing. This is a bit of a new offering for CCST. This is a way to bring some of the experts to have a conversation with you about topics that are emerging that we want to deliver in more real time. Some of you might know us from some of the reports that we've done in the past, which are a little bit larger and uh, take a longer time to deliver reports looking at the impacts of hydraulic fracturing or underground natural gas storage. We have a report coming out on biomethane heating values in a couple of weeks. And, uh, or you might know us for our CCST science fellows, or you might be a science fellow or have been one. Anybody science fellow in the room? Anybody know our science fellows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, they're even mentors to them. <laughs> Wonderful. So this is a, a chance for us to, again, be of service to your work. And so we want to hear from you what issues um, are relevant to what you're doing, how we can connect you to the experts, and make sure that you have access to the, the knowledge that you need to inform the work that you do. I, uh, in hosting this today, I'd especially like to thank Senator Dodd's office for, for sponsoring this for us. Is Les here? He was here. Oh, my best. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Les. <laughs> uh, and then I want to thank our partners again, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. You see Berkeley is here, another one of our partners, and Department of Water Resources, and the Water Foundation. And just a logistical note, uh, if you RSVP'd and you received a ticket for lunch, the lunches will be available at 1 p.m. as you exit the room. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Susan Hubbard, who is a CCSD council member. She's also a member of UC Waters Directors Council, and she is the Associate Director of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the Earth and Environmental Sciences. And she's going to lead the discussion. So and, and I'll take it over to you now. Um, I'd like to just follow along with what you were saying about CCST a little bit, and um, just that. CCST has been involved in water issues and water activities for, for some years. Um, in 2011, CCST um, developed a uh, report called Innovate to Innovation, which really identified several things that are both opportunities and challenge for California's economic prosperity in out years, and water was certainly identified as one of those. Um, and so as a follow-on, CCST took a little bit of a deeper dive um, in uh, developing a workshop report on California's future water achieving sustainability through investments in science and technology. And that had 10 recommendations that were important for California's uh, water future. And actually the very top one was the development of a water management system. Um, and it recommended that um, the State Water Resources Control Board and DWR work with experts to develop this. So fast forward, um, here we are <clears throat> several years later and um, Senator Dodd pinned the bill open and transparent water data act. Hopefully um, folks picked up the, the materials here um, that went into law in 2016 and there's been a lot of activity by um, the organizations represented here and CCST's played, played a role in that and that's what we're here today to talk about, to say a little bit about um, what's happened since that was enacted, what is coming down the pipeline, and hopefully to hear your questions and your thoughts as well as um, things you may be working on um, now that are, are relevant to, to what's happening there. 
So the way that we've um, organized this uh, briefing today is uh, really I'll, I'll ask um, a series of questions to our distinguished panel and actually I'd love to have you introduce yourself in just a moment. Um, and But please feel free, like Amber said, to this is pretty informal to um, ask questions as we go along and we'll try and leave you know, 10 minutes or so at the end at least just to have, have, a, have a conversation. Um, so, can we introduce each other? And then actually I'd love to go around the room and just have people very briefly say your name and your organization so we can have a sense who's in the room. Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Kaparski. I direct the water program at the Center for Law, Energy, and Environment at UC Berkeley School of Law. I'm Chris McCready. I work with the Department of Water Resources and um, I am working with a fantastic team within DWR and also our fellow agencies and our partners to implement AB 1755. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Maya with the Water Foundation and I oversee our groundwater and water data related work. Amber Mace, I'm the Deputy Director of the California Council on Science and Technology. Doug Thompson with the Department of Water Resources. Al Fran, Speaker Thomas. I'm going to see a little bit also. I'm going to do it to the Ghana's office, information system analyst. So we're here to learn um, in terms of data and data. Mike here. Yeah, we are. Our number is Speaker's Office. Keep covering. Thank you, baby. Paul Jacobs, Senate Office Research. Julian Paul, also at Senate Office Research. Ted Lagos, also at the Senate Office Research. Alvin Rush is under Republican Office of Policy and Budget. Mamadine Scott, CCSD Science Fellow of the Senate Environmental Quality Committee. Teresa Fayot, CCSD Science Fellow of the Senate Office of Research. Ben Tang, California Research. Keith Leo, Science Fellow with the Assembly of Water, Parks, and Wildlife Hi, Susan Reyes with the Office of Senator Hernandez. Tom Lewis, with the Office of Fish and Wildlife. Dennis O'Connor, Senate Natural Resources and Water. Uh, Cameron Zarbar, hoping to be a CCSD Science Fellow with the Office of Natural Resources and Water. Uh, Cameron Zarbar, hoping to be a CCSD Fellow. <laughs> <laughs> no affiliation. Walking us about State Water Resources Control Board. George Eisen, Delta's Georgia Council. Here you are, the Department of Water Resources. Susan Sullivan, the Jim Hall, the Department of Water Resources. Paul Shippen, the Department of Water Resources. Christine Casey, CCSD. Ben Lanza, CCSD. Sarah Brady, Director of Policy Engagement with CCSD. Michelle Scheider, the CCSD. Brayden Zhu, CCSD. Great, welcome everybody. Thank you again for attending. So Mike my Water Foundation, um, can I start with you? Can you tell us a little bit about what is the water problem? Um, what is the water problem and why did it motivate the development of, or thinking around um, AB 1755? Sure, well it's interesting how you, you frame that as the water problem because the, the water data problem is actually a symptom of the water problem. <laughs> um, so you, you hear often that we have gaps in data, not enough information, or not at the right time scale or something. And that is a problem for some very specific examples, and it can be a very large problem. Um, but, but just as problematic, if not more, is that we have lots and lots of data and information. It's just all over the place. And that's because our water management system is so fragmented. So with so many different entities touching water management in different ways, and they all collect their own information, and they're, they have their own mission in mind, so it's not through any malicious uh, reasons. They, you know, sharing with others doesn't rise to the top of your to-do list. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea behind this act was to take the information that's already out there, um, that's available but maybe not accessible, and put it all in one place so that it's easier for folks to find. Very good, thank you. So why is the Water Foundation interested in this issue? The Water Foundation was interested, it started actually through our interest in markets. Um, seeing the more frequent floods and droughts, um, extreme weather and sigma, and the pain that will be coming to some folks, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, leading to a tool in the toolbox of some flexibility around markets actually, quite honestly, that's how we started. We thought this was going to be like a clearinghouse for where transactions were happening. And then quickly that grew to, well, to have a thriving market, um, we certainly have imperfect information, um, including what water is available to trade, where are the fish at different times. Um, so it grew into something much larger, which was just having a better handle on all of the water information out there. 
And that was something we were quite comfortable with, and it's actually grown into a whole program that we have now related to making data more available. Um, it's, it's bigger than the Water Foundation, though, too. It's, it's an interest of philanthropy more broadly. I've heard a lot of interest in it over the last several years. Mm -hmm. There's uh, something called the Aspen Institute, um, and they, together with the Duke Nicholas Institute and Redstone Strategies Group, convened a dialogue series in 26 and 16 and 17 um, that led to an, a culminating report called the Internet of Water. And so I won't get into all of that, but I recommend you all go look at that. Um, and it shows the interest in philanthropy and others on this issue. Likewise, the business community, the sponsor of the bill was actually the Bay Area Council. And mm -hmm. so it was an easy fit for business to kind of see this common sense need as well. Thank you, it's really interesting. Um, so as we've um, been involved in this issue, there's certainly a lot of discussion about the importance of data being sufficient and useful um, and accessible and used. What does that mean? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I'll tell you what I think it means. Okay. And I'm, those I'm blatantly stealing from the good work that the state has done to come up with those words in that exact way. Uh, but it's all wrapped in this cornerstone of their vision that this has to be user-centered. Mm -hmm. um, so sufficient to me just means it's a recognition that you can't do it all. You shouldn't even try to do it all. It wouldn't be a good use of public resources to take every single piece of data that's out there and make it all machine readable and available and, and linked up. So instead, you need to bring in just the amount of data that's sufficient to support users and decision makers and the decisions that they, they need. Um, accessible is just a recognition that publicly available data, which is what AB 1755 is about, um, is not necessarily easy to find or accessible. And so that's a key one, is to make sure that you can actually find the information. And then useful, again, it gets to that user-centered approach of if, if you put data together but it's not in the right form or it's not integrated with other data sets that make it useful to people that are actually making decisions or using it for research, then it's not really all that helpful. Um, and then data being used, in my opinion, um, I really appreciate the, the state partner agencies that are implementing this, taking this one on because it puts a giant bullseye on them. Um, you could comply with this law just by developing protocols and, and making a platform and then saying, we're good. But if no one's actually using it, then you're not changing anything, people aren't getting the information. So it puts a target, it's really the ultimate indicator of success that it's actually being useful and used by people. Thanks, that was super helpful. Chris, maybe if I can follow up from you, the Department of Water Resources is playing such a huge role and has such a huge responsibility. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about how the open water data platform is being uh, implemented to ensure that it is useful, particularly for decision makers. Yeah, um, I would be happy to to start that. But similarly, I, I'm sure that you know my colleague to my left here will be able to um, add more to to my remarks. But um, we are. Actually, I'm probably going to steal my own thunder, but I'll just say that we at the Department of Water Resources with our partners, and there were four agencies named in the legislation, and then there are four others who've joined us of their own volition, and so we, we really appreciate um, the, the voluntary nature of even just state agency participation in the solution here. Um, but we have together, you know, and we've formed and stormed and normed and all those things, and we have moved into a... Uh, I am very pleased to say a uh, very positive working relationship and in that process we have discussed um, any number of, of processes and, and um, goals for the project. We have agreed together to express our intent beyond what the legislation says just to, to underscore the point that Mike just made. Um, we are embracing in our strategic plan uh, a broader vision that, that it that goes, again, beyond the very letter of 1755 and more into the spirit of it. So we see that uh, our decisions are founded on good science and good data. And um, so we, uh, we are considering that discoverability is important. I'm going to say a few things, but I would like to refer you in your, in your homework. <laughs> Um, to, to please take a look at this one pager that I believe everyone's got. It's uh, on the back is a very small picture of this puzzle piece uh, diagram, but you also have a large one that you can put on your refrigerator at home. Um, 
Um, we have been fortunate to have so much partnership with uh, not just the state agencies, but also folks like these who um, have, through the blessing of AB 1755, we have a, a place to put all this energy. Many, many, many people have believed that data is powerful and have believed that it's under, you know, it's, it's not appreciated well enough um, and it's not used enough and it's difficult to find all that. So now with 1755, we're aligning together and identifying um, a real need to focus first on the user and to consider that, as, as Mike said, that uh, data all together doesn't solve the problem. Data put together in a way that answers questions is what we need to do. And so we have this philosophy about use cases, which I will let you explain if that's okay. Um, but um, we are also recognizing that rather than trying to pull all the data into one place, we would like to, to focus on federation as a strategy. And so federation, if you think of it this way, um, is a little bit like your library system. If you have a question, you have a, a, a topic of interest or an author you want to find, you might go into your local library, your branch, and you will be able to access a card catalog that tells you what's available to you. It may not all be on that site, on that in that specific building, but you will be able to discover its existence somewhere and be able to go find it or to request it. And so it's that concept that we're emphasizing as our long-term strategy federation as opposed to co-location. And so um, we, in that way, are emphasizing first increased discoverability and secondly, then this idea of integrating the data or um, interoperable data. And I know I'm not exactly directly answering your question, that, but- No, that's great. <laughs> you really provide a lot of information. Maybe, maybe you could just say a little bit more on the federation. Thanks for explaining that. You know, how will that really help with decision making? Right, and so um, with Federation, again, the, the understanding that we have, and I, I suspect anyone who's gone looking for data has had this experience. Sometimes you know it must exist, but you don't know who to talk to. Sometimes you might wonder if anyone's collecting it yet, and they may or may not be. And then you might also wonder, how does this small entity's data set relate to, say, a state agency data set? Um, they might be on the same topic, but they cover different geographic areas, so they might be at different time increments or so on. And so um, what we hope to do is to make it all discoverable to the user in a fairly seamless experience. Again, it may be that that data um, has to be sought after, but you could discover that it exists. And then through the use of metadata, and uh, um, we really fondly hope that folks will join us in having rigorous metadata, but we'll have some bare minimum um, expectations on that to consider a system federated. Um, we hope that the user will become informed about the data they want to use. And then ultimately, we really hope that um, some of the more innovative folks out there in the world who like to create apps will take that data and turn it into visualization tools. We'll take that data and use it, run it through models, and be able to provide that to their board of supervisors or others who are making decisions about investments in infrastructure or um, decisions about the lifespan or um, maybe the size of a reservoir, recognizing that we'll have more runoff, flashier flooding, et cetera. So we, again, with the focus on usability, <laughs> We hope that we will naturally be queued up for that data getting used, but it, it's, they both matter. Mm -hmm. So, okay. that help? Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Mike Kaparski from UC Berkeley. Um, so, they, as we've been hearing, there's a lot of data sets. Um, this is intended to bring this into more coordination. We've heard about the federation aspect. Um, there's AB 1755, and then Chris has described a revision. <laughs> Can you say a little bit about what, what do you think the chances are that AB 1755 will reach its goals? Um, before doing that, Susan, um, I'm inclined to break the fourth wall for a second, if I can, Please. with your permission. Um, uh, as the token nerd on this panel, I'm sort of sensitive to uh, <laughs> when, when uh, the discussion gets quickly into the details. And so I wanted to ask everybody here, because a lot of you are quite important for the fate of this legislation, whether it can work, um, whether you uh, understand just how important data is for the future of California being able to uh, manage its water. So uh, what I'd ask you to do, if you have any doubt 
that uh, data is fundamentally is crucial for us to change the way that, uh, that water is managed uh, uh, to meet the uh, challenges that we're facing as a state. I'd just like you to raise your hand so that we can try to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, come on, I'm not the only one in the minute. So, so let, me, let, me, let me make the question clear. Uh, raise your hand if you are, are buy into the notion, or if you believe the notion that data is absolutely crucial for water management in the state. Okay. Okay. So that's a great response, but it's not everybody. So I would suggest that uh, we make sure that we get the chance to get questions from these people and, and, and anchor that, because that's really the fundamental reason that we're here. It's not about AB 7255, but that's not why I'm, I'm here. It's about how can we understand this resource, its limitations, and how we can ma manage it better. So, um, uh, what was the question? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What's the likelihood that AB 1755 will reach its goals? Right. So, the way I'd answer that question is to think about the distinction between the legislative requirements, which are both broad and very simple, and the legislative opportunity, uh, which is goes far beyond that. Now, the the requirements of the law are, are fairly simple, and arguably could be met with posting static data, chef, data sets or even Excel spreadsheets online. Um, would that enable the state to move its water management to a more sophisticated level? Uh, arguably not necessarily, or arguably not. Um, and so the opportunity here, however, is to, t is to take the spirit of the law, which is about open, transparent, and accessible uh, and interoperable data, and data for the purpose of improving our water system and how it's managed and optimized. And to figure out how can we use the law as a springboard to uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and meet that larger challenge. And um, thus far, I think it's really important to understand that the state has risen to that larger challenge. Uh, and the past year or two have seen tremendous strides in understanding at the level of state agencies as well as at the level within the academy that I represent and the philanthropic sector and so forth. Um, so the progress is tremendous um, and, and in fact uh, I you know, credit directly some of our representatives here, Chris and, um, and Gary and uh, Joaquin uh, for, for um, driving forward this notion of, of data to what it can be, um, but a lot more is needed uh, and more and this momentum needs to continue. Um, so as far as how, how I would sort of handicap AB 1755, I think uh, signs are really good right now, um, but it's going to take a lot of, of continued momentum, including action from a lot of people in this room. That's fine. Um, so there's a, a, a lot of different ways that AB 1755 could be implemented. You're saying that um, that uh, that the, um, the folks involved are kind of going above and beyond. Can you talk a little bit about what some principles could or should be or are being considered in the implementation? So Chris, I think probably Chris and Mike each each mentioned the notion of a user-centered focus, and mm -hmm. the state has adopted this admirably in my view. Um, again, not just asking how can we provide data or bring data together, but starting with the question of well, who needs to use the data and uh, in, in what form are they going to need that data, uh, for what decisions, um, and uh, uh, in, in order to structure a system that can meet those end users' needs. So that, that, that notion of a user-centered perspective that puts decision makers uh, at all levels of, uh, uh, of water, involved in the water enterprise front and center during the design of the system uh, is as an essential principle that the state has adopted and I hope it will continue to develop that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, what kind of data are we talking about? 
What kind of use cases, what kind of data? Uh, so there are, um, another thing about water management generally is that it's not just about water. Uh, mm -hmm. Water touches arguably everything, but certainly for the pers from the perspective of the state's responsibilities, it touches uh, uh, a wide range of, top range of topics, agricultural management, uh, ecosystems, um, uh, health. public health, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the list goes on. And because of that, the, there is no single decision maker, with all due respect to the Water Board and, and to the DWR, there, there is certainly no single decision maker in the water world. Um, it's a very distributed system and, um, and multiple parties need multiple different kinds of data in different forms and different combinations. And so the notion of a federated system that Chris is describing um, is an attempt to understand that there are a range of data producers and then a range of data consumers and answer the question, how do we meet the the needs of the data consumers while enabling the producers to have the autonomy um, and not over complexify <laughs> make up a word, uh, the, the lives of those, the, the, the people who already put a tremendous amount of effort into producing. Are we missing any data? Uh, tremendously. Trem uh, yes, there's a lot of data missing, and that's not really the point of AB 1755, as you know. Uh, it doesn't to require that we produce any new sources. Um, but what your, your question gets to a, a really important point, which I think is a large part of the motivation for AP 1755, which is data gaps can take a large number of forms, uh, we have argued. Uh, a data gap can be data that just aren't there. If you just don't measure data in a stream, then there's a data gap and you don't necessarily know anything about what the stream flow is. But if a data gap for practical purposes can take the form of data that are not accessible or they're not in a form that can be accessed by a decision maker in a timely way with the resources and tools that they have at hand. So for practical purposes, data could exist, technically speaking, but without a system to bring those data together, they might as well not exist for, from the perspective of improving the ability to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. So data gaps take a lot of different forms and uh, AB 1755 is targeted at addressing one of those types of issues. Mm -hmm. okay. um, is there an institutional piece to this? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the first institutional piece is the, the fact that we um, have a vision here for a system with lots of different components and separate moving parts. Um, and therefore, a lot of coordination and conversation is needed. Uh, we collectively have started to seed those conversations. CCST, uh, along with a lot of partners, have, have uh, helped the state in jump-starting that process of, of engagement among agencies and stakeholders. But that's a really crucial thing that needs to um, to consider, uh, it needs to continue. Um, another is uh, on the topic of governance and financing generally. Again, we're um, not putting a new um, agency in place, of course, um, but by trying to bring together disparate parts that, that previously were independent, um, you uh, have a federated model that seems to be the most efficient and effective potential way to, to, to crack this nut. And at the same time, uh, it comes with some baggage and maybe some perverse incentives. Uh, one of those might be free, ri free ridership um, because uh, everybody wants to, well, uh, depending on your needs, right? Uh, uh, as, as an entity may be interested in using a lot of data and they may produce data, um, but they might want to take advantage of a, of a interoperable system to access other people's data more, in, uh, more easily, um, but may not have the ability uh, or the motivation to do the work that it takes to feed data into the system in those formats that won't be uh, costless. And so setting up a system of governance uh, that can provide the right incentives and rewards for, uh, for entities that contribute to a system as well as use it is essential. 
And ultimately, it all, it all comes down to the, the resources. Um, can this kind of system that will have huge benefits for the state, um, public benefits for the state, can that system uh, be uh, be funded? Can it can it um, can the, the financing model be developed that can make it uh, sustainable and sustaining? Hey, so you started to. We've talked a little bit about the nuts and bolts of AB. 1755, what motivated it, what are some of the activities, and now you started to move us into thinking thinking forward and what's important, and I'd just like to sort of pick up on that thread. There is a report that actually was out yesterday, is that right, Mike? Um, this one right here on governance and, and, um, and funding for open and transparent water data. Maybe we could just kind of continue that conversation and, and think about um, what are some of these early thoughts on funding and governance, if I can ask panel members? Maybe, Mike, you could take a lead on that. Sure. Yeah, so um, we, we recognized at the Water Foundation that you, know, you don't just help get a law passed and walk away. Um, and funding is always hard to come by. There's a lot of needs. Um, and so thinking in the long term, um, how do you sustain something like this over time? Uh, it's going to require more than just going year by year to the state legislature asking for general fund. That seems like a, a certain death to this. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, Mike touched on governance a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the law does not create a new entity, and I think a federated system is definitely the right approach. Um, but it does, Mike, raise some of the issues with that. and so. Just to highlight a little bit of what's in the report, it, it does have some recommendations. It does recommend a federated user-centered system, so that's highly consistent. This was a process, by the way, um, that was run by Redstone Strategies, or a consulting group that was part of, they, they co-authored and co-convened Aspen Dialogue in that Aspen report. So they had some, some credibility on this issue, and they worked with the state partner agencies and stakeholders to, to develop these recommendations. Um, in terms of um, funding, it requires, this is not earth shattering, but it's a portfolio approach. Um, so you can't just go to the same well over and over again, especially general fund, which is um, highly susceptible to um, economies going up and down, whether you're able to get the funds. So that starts to bring in, well, there's other interested players here and others that play a role in this. And how do you appropriately harness the interest of say the private sector and entrepreneurs and how did what role do they play? How do you get philanthropy to um, do more than just get something started in the first year? And how do you get users of the information to actually pay to help sustain this over time? Mm -hmm. And so the report um, actually recommends a dual conveyance. Uh, I'm sorry, dual conveyance. Oh. So going back to my Calfa days. <laughs> <laughs> a dual governance structure. So the state uh, would continue its its coordination through some sort of state governing um, group. Right now, it's I think the state partners, partner, partner agency team, um, and then there'd be a nonprofit like a 501c3 that would provide guidance for the platform. It might bring in um, recommendations on use cases that should be tackled first. Mm -hmm. It could have a SWAT team of data scientists that could be unleash to help bring folks in that maybe wouldn't want to voluntarily put their data out there, especially if they're in an area that's not resource rich to do that. So that just touches on some of the recommendations that are in the report and uh, there's copies here if it's not on your chair. Great, thank you. Congratulations on getting that out, right? <laughs> right in time for this briefing. Chris. Might I chime in just a little Please. bit? I, I, I would like to uh, agree with everything that Mike said, but I would like to add that um, we have been fortunate to receive, we, the state, um, the three of the agencies that are named in the legislation to receive um, some specific funding uh, for the current year that has allowed us to, to really get the flywheel going, but we would never be where we are without the cooperation and support of, of our partners and the <coughs> folks sitting to my either side of me, as well as many others, um, you also. Um, and so uh, I want to communicate that we have gotten very far, all things considered, with very little state investment, and I think that that, that approach where there's a mutual contribution toward a greater good is, is wonderful, and I hope that we'll continue that, but by that what I mean is I hope that there is a recognition that there is a state investment necessary for this public good that serves all of our citizens. 
um, the economic promise that we that we have available to us if we tap into the potential of data to help solve our problems is um, is great that promise is great and I think that the um, need for the state to communicate that commitment and uh, help contribute to the success the long-term success of this can't be overlooked I just want to make sure that we don't inadvertently communicate that because we've had voluntary contributions in kind services and uh, this ambition to have uh, investment opportunities for folks outside and portfolio I think the state still needs to show some some commitment to that as well and so I hope that we'll be able to continue that and I hope, sorry it's close no, to thank you it's an important point. <laughs> I really appreciate you bring that up um, Chris could you maybe as we're looking forward also say a little bit about the data platform itself yeah. where are we at um, yes. when can we potentially be able to use this <laughs> absolutely so um, First, I'd like to say that um, we're fortunate to count among our partners the Government Operations Agency, GovOps is their nickname, and um, they have been involved with our process and they host a data platform that's available to you right now if you haven't already gone and looked for it, I would encourage you to do that, it's data.ca.gov. And that has a lot of data sets that are state generated, uh, mostly, largely um, health, fish, fish, oh no, no, I, I'll leave the fish out of it for the moment. So um, I would encourage you to check that one out. But then more recently, um, the California Natural Resources Agency, of which DWR and Fish and Wildlife are, um, are contributing partners or, or agencies that belong, or departments that belong to the agency. Um, we have a CNRA platform that you can find at, uh, I wrote it down, so I always get it a little bit scrambled. Um, it's data just like the other one, data.cnra.ca.gov. And I'm happy to tell you that there's quite a lot of fisheries data and other ecological information available to you there, thanks in large part to our partners, Fish and Wildlife. Um, other data sets exist on there, I believe Energy's a partner. So anyway, if you get in there, you will be able to find in both of those portals a lot of data that exists that's, that's ready for publication and so on. Um, and in fact, I think those are on a handout that you have also, uh, this one, when you get back to your offices. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that the actual federation is still a work in progress. And um, so this philosophy of sort of unifying these, these portals, these two and others, uh, like a library system, is a work in progress. And so we are hoping later this year to um, kick off a federation test bed that we will invite folks to join us in. And those folks will include commercial interests, they'll include um, our partner agencies, and that'll include some sort of energetic uh, folks from the academic world, um, students, et cetera. And we hope very much that their enthusiasm um, will allow us to advance the federation and, and really test the system. Their feedback will inform the next iterations. And so, um, if you will, the the strings between these existing portals are still being assembled and connected. Thank you. Could I add to that a little bit? Um, just that coming soon near you yeah. um, is a way to actually play with this a little bit now and, and test it out. Yes, uh, there's a safe drinking water data challenge that we'll be launching in the summer. I think the dates are still being worked out in terms of like meeting space and, and locations and, and such. But it's um, co-sponsored by Barry Council, Imagine H2O, the West Big Data Hub, the Water Foundation, um, and in partnership with a whole bunch of state agencies. The logos are quite long, including DWR and the State Board, um, Fish and Wildlife, uh, GovOps, DTS, OPR, who have I forgotten? I don't know, quite a few. Um, could be. So the idea is to bring together the folks that are really impacted by having a lack of access to safe drinking water, um, and some of the EJ groups that represent them, the people that understand those issues, and ask a series of questions, and put them in the same room with the data scientists and the coders, um, and launch an event and issue a challenge that would actually be a way of testing the two portals. And so they'll put data sets up in each of them and see how they play together or not. And then hopefully they'll create some cool tools and visualizations and um, that will culminate in three months later or something like that. 
So if you follow any of the partner organizations on Twitter, there'll be hashtags and tweets and things coming soon, if not already happening today. Um, and dates will be announced soon, and it would be a great way for, for you to all help get the word out. Did you say about when that will be held? I believe they're looking at dates in June, okay. actually, to launch, so it's really, really close. There'll be a launch event in San Francisco, and then uh, a culminating like awards type event in Los Angeles. Okay, good. Interesting. Um, from the panelists, any other considerations as we move forward, or things we maybe haven't covered in this question and answer related to AD1755? I think that's one thing I want to touch on a little bit is technology. Um, you know, I can't, I don't need to drive home blind anymore on what the right route is that I should take thanks to Waze and Google Maps. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's folks that think, well, new technology will kind of solve everything for water too. And I'm really excited about the fact that the technology does exist. We don't really have a technology problem. But without the, the foundation that AB 1755 will set up without a home for all of that, it will only exacerbate the problem to have more and more information mm -hmm. of larger size, more real time, that's difficult to find. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one thing I neglected to mention earlier. And I'll also chime in sort of toward that end. I, I won because you didn't back up and explain exactly what we mean by, by use case other than who needs what data for what purpose and in what form. But um, we, we uh, I'm going to borrow from your writing. <laughs> but, um, so we characterize use cases for our purposes as short examinations of how de decision makers use data. And you know, this is a beautiful report. I encourage you to look at it. But where I want to go with that is that I'm fond of looking at use cases as sort of a common meeting place for the experts that we need um, to solve this problem together. And so there is that absolutely electrons are involved and there's an IT component. Um, but that we, we tend not to lack on the IT side. Most of us are carrying phones, as, as you've observed, and our, our cars have IT, and you know we have lots of IT in the departments and so on. What we what we have neglected really is what goes in that container, which is data, and then turning that data into a, a form and making it accessible and it's sort of giving a good running start to those innovators out there who can then do a, if you will, like an app similar to, you can find out the weather in Texas today and you can also find out how to get home today and you can also decide which bus you should take uh, according to which one's coming next. And so that level of usability is founded very much on data and then, as I said, then you need the innovators. So the use case is really an opportunity for us. It's sort of a meeting place for the business experts and the IT or technical experts to talk in a common language and, and support one another in getting to this goal that we have. So I just really want to emphasize they both have value and um, we we often mistake data as, a, as an IT problem and it's more than that. It's the relationships and I'm pleased to say that we have forged a lot of really positive working relationships here and again we have gotten where we are which is beyond what 1755 required of the state because of the partnerships that we've forged. So. Thanks for clarifying. And just um, you know, in the back of the handout here are a number of typical. How many use cases were there? In so, so uh, we did uh, twenty use cases as a group in the end. And this, this actually, if I may, yes. cues up what I think is an interesting story. Um, <coughs> although, again, I'm, as of the token nerd, I may be the only one that this is interesting to. Um, in the computer science world, the notion of use case uh, is something that drives, it's sort of foundational for uh, answering the question, how can you build a database that will meet the needs of users? And you try to, as Chris described, uh, ask, um, and, and there's, a, there's a, a, a trope or a heuristic that if a developer generates 20 use cases, for, then you will have covered the bulk of the, uh, the uses for a, a particular platform and, uh, and the rest will be just noise. You can design to meet those 20 use cases, you can pretty much handle everything. Um, so when we joined with CCST and DWR, um, at, at least one of the, us on the panel was skeptical of that notion. Um, and, and at least one of us on the panel observed that you don't actually know what a use case means in the context of water resources. So we, uh, without going into too much detail, and there's plenty of, of 
uh, documentation of the process and what we came up with, uh, we went and defined that and put forth at least one way with, uh, to, to formalize the notion of a use case and how those use cases could be developed in the context of water resources. Uh, as it turned out, and this is, was not, we were hoping to get eight uh, given the, the resources we had available. As it turned out, a lot of people chipped in uh, and we did 20. Uh, and, and again, it just happened that way. Now, I would argue that we are not anywhere near on the asymptote in terms of understanding the, the broad constellation of, of uh, use cases and uses of data and the context in which data are used. Um, but what we have, I think, shown is that this use case framework is at least uh, one possible way to concretize this question of what does it mean to have a user-centered focus? How can you generate a data system that will be usable for uh, the decision makers and will sort of, again, meet the spirit of AB 1755 as a, as a resource for better decision making? Um, and, uh, so the, uh, the other thing that, that Chris mentioned, which is really important, is innovation. And I would think of data as the raw material that will enable innovation, or in this case, without which innovation will not be possible. California is a leader in so many fields, uh, and in um, some ways, it's in a laggard in the water sector, uh, and so, surging forward in, in, uh, in data. Hopefully we can get from somewhere in the middle of the pack uh, nationally to a leadership role. Uh, and one sign of that, for those of us who have some pride of being a Californian, um, we were pleased to see that a group in Texas adopted our approach around use cases basically verbatim uh, mm -hmm. in order to think through te Texas's data problems. So, um, I like it actually verbatim. It, it was verbatim. They, they, they actually took the report. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for, so if imitation is the highest form of flattery, here we now we can hold our heads a little higher in California. <laughs> yes, please. Um, so, you know, there's a long history. We've been struggling with control of data, control of power, and you know that struggle that we had. You know, I remember 2009 was horrible. Um, uh, so. Tell me, what, what would you identify as a fact or story that best demonstrates that we're seeing public agencies at least collaborate? What would you tell us that this shows that really we've, we've gone over that hump and we are demonstrating collaboration? Particularly, love, and I invite Joaquin and anybody else to jump in here. Stewardship Council. Well, I think that public agencies, the state public agencies are coordinating. Um, at the, part of the reason the need for this law was really a legislative nudge to kind of force right. that arranged marriage in a way. That's why we want to hear um, how you're doing it. So, are you getting... <laughs> so, I mean, Chris, you should probably, you could probably describe the, the agency partners team, but they, they're, there's a whole group um, that's required based on the law to do it. And they have doubled that, I think, in terms of folks that are just interested in joining in um, the conversation and being a part they meet. How often? About monthly. Um, and they're sharing with them. Um, yeah, so I, I would like to say that the sharing of information, I mean, we, we, I know this will shock you, but at the state level, we kind of operate on the belief, most of us do, that everything we do is actually disclosable. Everything, it's appalling. And, um, but there, you're right, there is, <laughs> There, there still exists among some of those data collectors in any given agency, and this could be local or state level or beyond. Um, some, some, there can be trepidation that my data is not perfect, and if somebody sees this imperfection, they're gonna, it's going to discredit everything. And I've heard a really nice um, antidote, if you will, to that um, that we hope to imbue as we go forward and try and generate enthusiasm among those people that we still need within our agencies to put their data up and such. You're essentially crowdsourcing your QA, QC to a certain extent. Obviously, you want to have performed QA, QC and be responsible, and we want to keep stewardship as close as possible to the creation or collection of data as, as we can. But we also recognize that many eyes, you know, so many hands make light work, many eyes improve QA, QC. And so um, if we can shift folks even more toward this philosophy that 
it's all one team and it's all one cause, um, which I realize sounds very idealistic, but um, there are incentives for our folks if they think of it this way um, to make their data available at the program level. And one of them is essentially, again, having that many more people helping you to keep it correct. Um, if we stay in the posture of user feedback, then we can look at that as assistance and not criticism. Uh, there is also, and I'm going beyond your point, but I will also say that I think an incentive for folks uh, to share their data, and this doesn't come from me, but it makes a lot of sense to me. We do respond to Public Records Act requests all the time, and the, the federal government, they have theirs. And if we are more openly sharing our data, we likely reduce those requests, and we also empower our, our public citizens to help join us in innovation and advancement. And so I think there is room for it to really be a unifying effect, and for us, to get more directly to your question. For those of us who are participating in the 1755 implementation, it has been a huge bridge, and it's causing us to work together. We are not necessarily, I'm, we're not sending our data across to, to the boards yet, but theirs is up, ours is going up, and so I think we are getting there. But it's, as you know, change management is where it's at. That's the hard part, and um, we are actually about to embark on some staff um, workshops and help folks to, to get enthusiastic about this because if you hook the heart, the body will fall, right? So this is what we hope. <laughs> so I don't know if that helps you, but you know, I know. So you put the, the data is out, not necessarily that you're sending to each other, but so you make right. Well, it's it's it. The philosophy here is not so much about sharing as in two-dimensional sharing. It's about sure. accessibility broadly. Right. And the protocols that that are required. Well, it's sort of like the rule book or the playbook for how data becomes, it's called interoperable. Basically integrating it, um, what kind of metadata standards you need, making sure that data can talk to each other. So using that federated system, that vision of it being federated, people can still hold on to their own data, but if they follow the rules, it will, others can get that information more easily and find it and it's, it's, it's more accessible. Thank you. We have a question over here yeah. first. If we and the report is under um, data gaps and limitations that require pricing data is limited. So how, how can we improve that and why why is that the case? And um, yeah, how can we improve that? Because there's a lot of legislative and budget proposals currently in the works to help improve access to drinking water. So how can we make better Decisions with that data. Uh, so there are a number of um, dimensions to water pricing data. One is about urban water rate structures. Uh, currently, there's no um, uh, centralized place for urban water agencies to put those. So the existence of a centralized repository is almost a prerequisite for making those data. Uh, transparent and accessible. Um, there may be other elements, other incentives behind that uh, needed in addition to that to make that happen. Um, but this is one of many data gaps. Um, there are also uh, 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 another aspect of, of um, water pricing might have to do with water transfers and water markets and uh, more transparency around what is happening at multiple levels there um, is something else that the system in concept could, uh, could support. Um, but this, in my view, AB 1755 isn't in and of itself um, a requirement for that kind of access and sharing. It, it's an enabling condition, um, and specifics like that I would think would require different level, different actions, specific actions at the level of agencies or perhaps the level of the legislature to uh, force that broad scale uh, uh, sharing, data sharing and transparency. One or two more questions. Hi, so I think everyone here was on board with the data being important, even the people who didn't raise their hands, probably. Um, but you also talked about the struggle to maintain continuous funding um, down the road so that this initiative can continue and continue to grow and be more useful. Um, so to get that continued funding, I would imagine that you are looking for some early sort of milestones where you can see that, hey, this data is working, we've saved money, we've delivered safer drinking water somewhere. The decision makers are actually using it. 
And I'm wondering um, what sort of early wins you would say um, you have in mind that this kind of data being available um, might generate. Well, you're right. Um, you need early wins, and this is such a wonky topic. Um, when it's nebulous, just we need data because it's good. It's very mm -hmm. hard. Um, so I, th I think the approach, thanks to uh, my colleague to the left and Mike and CCSD and you are adopting it, of this use case approach is really important because it allows you to take an issue like what we're doing with the Safe Drinking Water Challenge and then try to develop some of those success stories. And then it becomes not about the data so much as about that particular issue. Um, and if you can figure out what the right ones are that people are interested in at that time, and you, you might be able to gather funding around that. And then you can see what you get out of it and start to tell those success stories. I think also in the long run, we need to start to show that there's some efficiencies to be gained here. So um, one of the things this could do, if done well, is to shine a light on, boy, why are we asking the same owner of this well to report to three different people the same information? If that's all out there, why don't we do that one time? Um, and if we can start to actually have clear examples of of this helping with that, I think that will be quite helpful as well. Um, the funding is tough. Um, I, I think it's very iterative right now and speculative, um, unfortunately, but that's the approach I think is the best path forward for us. And as, as Chris noted, there's always going to be a role for state funding here um, because they hold so much of the information um, and they're the ones on the front lines of putting it all together related to implementing this. So all the other funding can help quite a bit, but there's always going to be a role for that. I think at the last minute, I'll probably ask all of you to uh, please fill out your survey. Uh, please let us know if you have other briefings you'd like to hear from us about. Um, if you have a lunch ticket, please capture your lunch on the way out. And then I would uh, like to thank our wonderful moderator and our panelists for an excellent panel. And I think they might be around for a few minutes if you have some additional questions. Thank you so much.